one to the other. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. There's seven aspects to this sermon of mine. Now, just to fill you in, I preached this sermon to myself Saturday afternoon, and it went on for 20 minutes. I thought, well, that's not too bad. Uh, last night, about 11 o'clock, I thought I'll preach that sermon again. So I preached it again, and it went on for 25 minutes. So I thought, well, I better stop there with this practice lark uh, and leave it at that. Uh, but it will not be too long, hopefully. Uh, but what I just want to share with you, uh, when I got this passage to study, uh, I thought, yes, I'll, uh, I, I love this particular uh, passage. Uh, the Gospel of John is not like any other gospel. Uh, it's slightly different. Uh, whereas the other Gospels, uh, they have lots of parables in and uh, laws of miracles uh, going on. Uh, John's Gospel is not like that. It just has seven main miracles, which John calls signs. Uh, and we all know what a sign is. It's pointed to something. Uh, a signpost on the road tells you the way to go, where you're coming from. And here, John uh, is is pointing people to Jesus through the whole of his book. Uh, and I just want to just link, link up with these seven signs this morning. I hope it won't bore you. Uh, it certainly didn't bore me when I read it. It, it, it enthused me uh, with the fact that this is the God that I love and serve. Uh, and I want to pass that on to you this morning. So the very, very first sign was when Jesus was at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. He'd gone there at the invitation of the guests, uh, him and his disciples were there, uh, and everything had gone smooth as silk until, uh, we've all had those moments in lives, until, uh, but till they run out of wine. And when they run out of wine, Jesus' mum just simply says to the people that's in charge of the wine, whatever he says to you, do it. They'd never seen a miracle before, ever. Uh, they hadn't a clue what this Jesus of Nazareth was about, really. He'd been preaching and teaching and talking to them, and everybody was sort of hanging on his words, but they'd never seen any miracles. And here, uh, Jesus had just said, uh, fill the water pots with water, fill them to the brim, and then pour out to the governor of the feast. And that's what they did. They filled these huge water pots that were meant for washing and what have you. And they filled them to the brim. Then they poured out. And as they poured it out, it miraculously turned into wine. And everybody around that, that, that had anything to do with it knew where it had come from. I wouldn't have liked to have been the one that poured it out to the governor first. Here, sample this. Uh, but they did. And the governor of the feast said, why is it? Why is it that at the, a normal uh, wedding, you would give the good wine out first, uh, and then when people are well drunk, you would give the uh, inferior wine out? But you have saved the best wine until now. And my friends, Jesus is always giving the best things out. Uh, and that's the little story about the very, very first sign uh, that John writes down. He said, I'm going to write this down so that people can uh, read it and, and understand just what Jesus is all about. The second sign is the royal official's son who was dying. He asked Jesus to come and heal him, and Jesus said, I'll come. Uh, didn't need to move. Jesus just said to the man, your son will live. And as the man went away, the, the, uh, the people from his house came to meet him and said, your son's alive. He said, what, what, what time did he begin to? And it was the exact time that Jesus told him that his son was going to live, uh, that uh, the miracle happened. And so the second sign that, that, that uh, uh, John puts in his, in his, in his book, the sign of this royal official whose son was dying and Jesus healed him. And the whole household, the Bible says, believed. And that's a word that I just like to home in on this morning quite a few times, belief. John is wanting people to believe in Jesus Christ. The third sign is the, an awkward one, pool of, of Bethesda. In, in the, the city of Jerusalem, there was a pool. And every now and again, 
the waters of this pool, an angel, the Bible says, would come down and move the waters. And whoever got into the pool first, after the moving of the waters, was healed. And, and, and everybody was sat around. There was loads of folks there, all with ailments, some with blindness, some with this disease. And they were all there under the porches here of Bethesda, waiting for the movement of the waters. Uh, and then the first person in was healed. But there was one man there. He'd been there for 38 years. You imagine that, my dear friends. When I read that as I was studying this, I thought, 38 years in the same place, waiting for the movement of the waters. And, and Jesus comes along and says, do you want to be made whole? Looks at Jesus uh, as if there's something wrong. He said, yes, he said, I do. But he said, as soon as the water moves, I try to get in as fast as I can, but there's people quicker than me. They get in and they're healed and I'm still here. And so disappointment and sadness and heartache have been this man's life for 38 years. And then Jesus comes on the scene and John is there viewing this and he's looking at the situation. And Jesus just says to the man, be healed, take up your bed and walk. And the Bible says immediately, he rolled up his mat, got up as fit as a flea and gave glory to God and off he went. The Jews, just listen to this little snippet, the Jews saw what had happened and do you know what they said? They said it's the Sabbath. You shouldn't be carrying your mats on the Sabbath day, it's not allowed. You can't do that if you're a proper Jew. You, 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 you're breaking the law. And this little snippet is what he said. He said, the man that healed me, he told me to carry me mat. Who am I going to listen to? You're going to listen to the one that can meet your need and be there for you. And after 38 years, this man went home rejoicing. He went into the temple to praise God and to thank him for his mercy. And his life was completely changed around. And John says, I'm going to write that in. That's if I, if I write a book, that's going in uh, this pool of Bethesda when this man was miraculously touched by Jesus himself. The fourth sign is one that you'll all know. Jesus is out there, he's preaching. The thousands of people are just gathered together to listen to him. And this young man, 30-year-old or just over, is telling them about the eternal things of God. And he's... he's and, and everybody's listening to him, but they're getting hungry. They've been there all day. So Jesus turns round to his disciples. He said, the folks are hungry. Just look at them. They've been listening to me all day. My sermon's gone on a lot longer than Phil's this does. Uh, what? He said, give them something to eat. Give them something to eat. Andrew, the one that introduces people to Jesus, he's a lovely character. He's generally the one that still, he introduces Peter to Jesus, by the way, you know. Here's my brother. Uh, and, and so uh, Andrew says, there's a lad here with five barley loaves and three small fish. But what are these among so many? Now, I've heard a rumor, a few rumors about the miracles in the Bible. Many of them, in fact, all of them, I totally disagree with. But I, he I heard the rumor that this little lad, his surname was Warburton. And his dad owned a bakery. And that's actually what happened. It wasn't just five barley loaves. His mum had put the five barley loaves up because he was going out for dinner. She said, make sure you eat these uh, to keep you healthy. And, and, and have, you got a, have you got clean underwear on in case you have an accident? That's what mum said, by the way. Uh, you know, she, she, she pampered him and, and she gave him, and, and he just handed it over to Jesus. And the Bible tells us that Jesus began to break the bread. And John is stood there peering at Jesus. And as Jesus breaks the bread and breaks the fish and hands it out and fills the baskets up, John is one of the guys that's carrying the baskets out to the 5,000 people uh, to feed them. 
And John is just absolutely in awe of the majesty and the power uh, that Jesus displays here uh, in this particular miracle when he feeds 5,000 men beside women and children. This is the fourth sign uh, that John writes down so that you will believe. And, uh, and that's why he's, he's wrote it down. And there John is, is, is in the atmosphere of this miracle that is bringing blessing and, and food to thousands of people. The next one, the next sign that uh, uh, John writes in is Jesus tells them to go across the sea in, in a boat and they set off at, just after this miracle, they set off across the sea. And, and while they were there crossing the sea, uh, it became stormy, uh, and the weather wasn't conducive to sailing. It wasn't a happy, smooth sail. It was a rough, horrible sail. And just as they're, they're in the, the depths of the storm and the, and the wind and the rain, they see this figure walking on the water, and the disciples are scared to death. What on earth is happening here? There's this apparition that's coming towards us on the waters, on this rough sea. And it's Jesus, of course. He left the disciples to go across in the boat, and then he decided to walk there himself. But of course, he can walk on water because he created it. He's the God of miracles. He's the God that has con absolute control of nature and over everything. And Jesus just walking on the water and he says, don't be afraid, lads, it's me. Help me into the boat. And the Bible just simply says the boat was immediately at the other side of the lake. This is Jesus demonstrating to, to, to John and the rest of the disciples that he is in control of the weather. He's in control of the wind and the rain. He's in control of the elements because he's the God that made them in the first place. <clears throat> so the fifth sign, Jesus walks on the water uh, on this uh, rough night, three and a half miles from land. He lets his disciples know that he's capable of doing this and he gets into the boat with them. And this great miracle of walking on the water, John Clarks, he said, I'm going to put that down in my book. And then we come to the sixth sign. Two left. Uh, I'm doing very well. My wife will be pleased with me, perhaps. Uh, the sixth sign is this. It's in chapter nine. Uh, this is one of my favorite chapters in the whole of the Bible. It just tells of a man that was born blind and Jesus healed him. The situation was that they arrived at this town and there was this blind man sat at the side of the road that had never, ever seen. He'd never seen a person. He'd never seen a tree. He'd never seen the sun rise. He'd never seen it set. He'd never seen anything the whole of his life because he was born blind. And Jesus went to him and spat on the ground. He made play with the spittle and he put it on the eyes of the blind man. And he said, go to the pool of Siloam and have a wash. Uh, and so he went, and the Bible says that he came back seeing. His eyes were suddenly opened by this miraculous uh, person called Jesus Christ, who would just come on the scene and just touched his eyes, and this man that had been born blind received his sight. Never happened before in history. Everybody accepted that this miracle was a one-off. It doesn't happen every day. In fact, it had never happened before. But Jesus had come onto the scene and healed this blind man. And then we have the same trouble again. Because the Pharisees, the religious folks, religious folks get very, very bad press, and it's no wonder. Uh, because they're just in it for the religion side. But Jesus wants to give more than religion. He wants to give life. He wants to bring blessing and healing and 
oldest of people. And so this sixth sign, he, he uh, anoints this man's eyes with clay and he can see. But the people that are around there said, this is rather strange. Are you sure it's the same man? We'll go and ask him. So they trot over. They say, are you the one that was born blind and, and, you've, he, and, and you've been healed? He said, I am. He said, uh, he said well, they said, how, how did it happen? Said, I, don't, I don't know how it happened, he said. He said, I'm just the recipient of this, of this, this, this blessing. I, what, all as I know is that once I was blind and now I can see. It's as simple as that. I don't even know the name of the person that's done it. Uh, but of course, the disciples did. And John particularly, he was there uh, watching this unfold, uh, this beautiful story of how Jesus had compassion and, 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 uh, and, and, and he was caring for this man uh, that was in this dire situation. And so, although it was on the Sabbath, Jesus did good. Uh, you see, God is Lord of the Sabbath. He said that the Sabbath is, is, uh, is, is, is not something that you, you've got to just adhere to in a legalistic way. Uh, the Sabbath is, is, is meant for your blessing. That's why it was instigated uh, way back in the Old Testament. And so this uh, sixth sign uh, was the sign of someone uh, that was born blind, that Jesus opened his eyes. The seventh sign is this, and this is the last one that John puts in his book. Uh, the seventh sign is the sign of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Jesus was out preaching in the countryside, back in Bethany, a little place about a couple of miles from Jerusalem. Uh, these three people live, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, three friends of Jesus. Jesus used to bob in for a brew on a regular uh, occasion. Whenever he was going past this area, he would sit in and have a meal with them and, and, and sit down and have a chat. And they loved him to bits and he loved them. But Lazarus was sick and, and, and it looked like it was going to be terminal, this sickness. And so the girls sent for Jesus. They said, go and find him. He's somewhere up in Galilee, somewhere preaching. You'll know where he is because there's a load of crowds all, 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 all gathered around him. Go and tell Jesus we need him. And so they went and told Jesus that his friend, Lazarus, was sick and, and that he was really needed in Bethany uh, because the, the, the girls were worried sick uh, that this uh, situation would turn uh, out nasty and would turn out with resulting in the death of Lazarus. Uh, but Jesus didn't come. The Bible just simply says he waited two days. Why would he do that? Why would this man that loved this little family, because the Bible says he did, uh, why would he wait two days? And then he said to his disciples, he said, come on, lads, he said, we'll, we'll go now to Bethany. They said, wait a minute, that is seriously dodgy. Because the Jews have been trying to kill you, and it's two miles from Jerusalem, and, and they'll all be there uh, wanting to get at you. But Jesus was adamant that he was going uh, to meet Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And so he set off on the track to, uh, to Bethany, and when he got to the outskirts of the village, Martha was the first to see him. She legs it out to him, and these are more or less her exact words. Lord, if you'd been here, it would have been different. If only you'd have come a bit earlier, a few days earlier, you could have changed the situation. Uh, but Jesus just asked her to be patient and to have faith. Two minutes later, her sister comes, Mary. She's the one that sits at Jesus' feet while Martha does all the work. Uh, and, and, and she reprimands her, her for it sometimes, uh, but Jesus sorts that little hiccup out. She say, he says that Mary has chosen the better part, but then Martha comes around and she, uh, after the resurrection of, of, of Lazarus, it just simply says, Martha served. She's doing it for Jesus. But here, uh, 
Jesus comes to the situation and Mary says exactly the same thing, word for word. Lord, if you'd been here, if you'd only come when we asked you, uh, you could have altered the situation. And Jesus just turned to them and said, where they laid me, take him to where you've laid him. And they took him out to the tomb where there's a huge stone rolled across the front uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the tomb. And uh, Jesus is there. And, and it just simply says, and Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the Bible, incidentally. Uh, verse 17 of that chapter, Jesus wept. And everybody said to about Jesus, just shows how he loves him. Just look at him. He's heartbroken because uh, Lazarus has, has died. But Jesus then turns to the people and he says, roll the stone away. Get rid of the stone. Martha said, wait a minute. No, don't do that. Because he's been dead four days. Uh, there's, a, there's a bad order. It's, it's not nice. Don't. Uh, and Jesus says, roll the stone away. And as they roll the stone away, Jesus, this lowly carpenter from Nazareth, this one that had uh, done all these miraculous signs in front of uh, the disciples, uh, he just simply shouts out uh, to the open grave, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, the Bible says, the kid, and the uh, don't know what's happened here. Rough out here. Where does this clip go? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Teamwork. You need it, Chich. Uh, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, he that was dead came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes. Jesus says, loose him and let him go. We heard about the linen cloths a couple of weeks since from James, didn't we, here uh, in our church, how they bound him in linen cloths. That's the Lord Jesus. That's a few weeks uh, farther on. But here we find Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. This miracle that happened, and everybody that's standing around, John in particular, is just looking at this situation, looking at what has just happened be before their eyes, can't really believe it, but they know that this Jesus is someone special. This Jesus is the one that is capable of raising the dead, because he is the one who created us in the first place, and he's the one that is in control of everything in every situation. Uh, so Jesus, uh, although he waited two days, it was for a reason that he might be glorified, that the people might see this last miracle that John writes about. And now, my time is nearly up. My watch is going back on. But there's one verse of scripture that sparked all this off for me when I was studying it. And I'm going to read it to you now. It's, it's in the, the 20th chapter. Uh, it's the last verse, verse 30. Just listen to what it says, would you? Jesus did many other miracle, mir miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Isn't those two fantastic verses? I'll read them to you again. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. John's not wrote them down, but... These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. My dear friends, I want to tell you this morning <coughs> that I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that this Jesus who came to earth 2,000 years ago, born in a manger, born in obscurity, born in poverty, and went to a cruel cross on Good Friday to die for our sin. This Jesus is the Christ. 
He's the one that was going to come from heaven to save us and did. And whatever Jesus set out to do, he did it uh, because he had the capabilities. And he was the only one that could forgive sins and the only one that could die for our sins. And here, John is saying that I want you to believe it. Uh, I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of God. And then believing you may have life in his name. I trust this morning that each one of us knows a little bit about the life of God living in us. Uh, we, we could have come to him uh, and asked him for forgiveness. Uh, and, and when we come to him and, and repent of our sins, which we do on a regular occasion here, uh, we, we come to God and we just say, Lord, forgive us. And he does because he can. And John knows this. And John knows that we have to uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and you will be saved. And so my little talk to you is over. There's one other little verse of scripture. Uh, it's in the next chapter, and it's the last one. Uh, I'll just turn over the page and I'll just read that for you as well. Why were you? Verse 25 of chapter one says this, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written in Jesus. John didn't write it all down. He didn't put every dot down and every little detail of Jesus. He didn't write uh, these things down as such, but he wrote these down so that you can believe. And so that you in Blackburn, a little cotton town in, in the middle of the Northwest, we, we can come and we can get to know Jesus, who he is. He's the son of God. He's the Christ uh, that was going to come into the world to save sinners. And he did. And each one of us, we should be believing. And I hope and I trust and I pray that each one in this service this morning knows what it's like to believe in God, to put your trust in him, to put your hope in him, uh, to rely heavily upon him throughout life, and we will finally see him in glory uh, when, when the end comes. Thank you very much for listening uh, to those uh, seven signs uh, that Jesus is the Christ.